The astronauts are strapped into their spacecraft. They're going through the final checkout to be sure they're really ready to go. If all goes well, Apollo 11 astronauts, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins are to lift off on the voyage man always has dreamed about. Next stop for them, the moon. When will you fire off your first rocket, and where will you send it to? I will, I will fight from Lusaka, and uh, if we go straight to the moon... On a clear day, astronauts can spot the Sahara, the world's largest hot desert, or even Mount Kilimanjaro, Africa's tallest mountain in Tanzania, through portholes on the Tiangong spacecraft. We've seen a lot of recent developments around Africa and China cooperating on space exploration and various space technologies, and that's why in this episode of The Crane, an Africa-China podcast, we are going boldly into space. So Amadeus, today, let's talk about space. Let's talk about it. (laughs) And as you just heard in the above clip, the preceding clip, this is a short part of a kind of visual arts documentary film that imagines, it's called Afronauts, African, you know, astronauts. And it basically is reimagining the experience of Africans in space. And I think it's a lot of it is uh, inspired by, in your own country, Amadeus, in Zambia, in, back in the 1950s, 60s, it was a Zambian who uh, led a process of developing Afronauts, as, he, as they were dubbed at the time. He was a school teacher who created what he called the Zambian Space Program, and he was training aspiring teenage astronauts. And, you know, this was in the middle of the Cold War. It was the eve of Zambia's independence from Britain. And this man, Edward Coloso, told um, Associated Press reporters that, and I quote, some people think I'm crazy, but I'll be laughing the day I plant Zambia's flag on the moon. Unfortunately, we are yet to see a Zambian flag Uh, floating or flying. I'm not sure what the atmosphere is exactly on the moon yet, but I think that moment, even though a lot of Western media was mocking um, that project and this man, I think it spoke more to the aspirations of, you know, Africa wanting to lead its own process of technological development. But we haven't necessarily seen that, and that's why we wanted to talk about it, because last week, between the 4th and 10th of October, the United Nations was hosting its World Space Week, which, you know, it celebrates the launch of the first human, um, or human-made Earth satellite, the Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union, and basically opened up the way for space exploration in a very uh, challenging moment in history, because, you know, it was an Uh, the middle of the then Cold War, it was in 1957, and the world looked very geopolitically divided in the way it does today, I I must say. Um, But the the theme, there's a theme each year this year, it's space and sustainability, which we're going to talk a little bit about the sustainability question uh, shortly. But Amadeus, I mean, what does actually Africa's space footprint or kind of space technological industry look like? Because, um, you know, I'm based in South Africa and Mark Shuttleworth, uh, I think that's his name, Mark Shuttleworth? I was about to say Shutterberg, <laughs> like Zuckerberg. Shuttleworth. It was Shuttleworth, yeah. They they hyped him up as the first African in space, which um, was very political because, of course, he was from, a, I, th- I believe, an English uh, settler background. And he was indeed actually not the first African person in space. I believe uh, the first African or African descended person who uh, ever got into space was a Cuban cosmonaut uh, who was actually flown into space by the uh, Soviet Union in cooperation uh, with Cuba. So, but you know, of course, uh, I'll take that. I'll take that. That's a win for the continent. That's a win for I us. I hear you. I hear you. I, I don't count the uh, millionaire <laughs> South African settler guy who then moved out of Africa <laughs> as the first African in space. No offense. <laughs> 
So what is the actual situation? Do we have any kind of thriving industries? Is it, uh, from what I understand, it's pretty nascent. Uh, it is nascent and it's pretty um, modest. Um, maybe to uh, give context to this, there was a, a funny but somewhat sad and typical story that happened. And, uh, this happened way back in 2005. So in 2005, um, the United States uh, mainland got hit by uh, the famous or the infamous Hurricane Katrina, which uh, flooded New Orleans and caused massive damage and suffering to the people. And actually, one of the first satellites to um, bring pictures um, of this uh, oncoming hurricane to the people was a tiny little Nigerian satellite. And this satellite made international headlines because, you know, like, uh, oh, Nigerian satellite um, warns the United States of Hurricane Katrina, you know, and um, just this headline caused so much controversy that there were irritated politicians in Britain and special interest groups that demanded that the British government suspend all development aid to Nigeria as it was spending money on an, I quote, unnecessary space program. So that kind of gives you an idea on how the global north <laughs> views African <laughs> uh, space industries endeavors in general, you know, and I, I don't think that has changed at all. So Africa's space spending has been very, very humble. Between 1998 and 2022 this year, African countries have spent approximately 3 billion US dollars on space projects cumulatively over a period of 24 years, just 3 billion. To put this in context, in 2019, the United States spent 19.5 billion on NASA alone. And the Chinese spent 11 billion US dollars on their national space agency. That's, so that's what Africa spent in 24 years, a single major space player spends in a year times five, you know, easily. Now, in 2021, the African space economy was valued at just under $20 billion and was projected to grow by about 16% to um, $22.64 billion by 2026. And that in the end, it would end up employing 19,000 people across the continent. This is tiny. You know, 19,000 people um, out of a continent of almost 2 billion people is a drop in the ocean. Um, 20 plus billion dollars isn't really that much when you look at the size and the scale of the continent, population, etc. So um, when we are looking at the issue of space technology in Africa, we also have to consider that... Uh, one of the key components that African governments and industry is interested in is satellite technology. And uh, this satellite technology tends to be acquired from outside the continent. So African countries actually go to uh, the global north, some go to China, and they will spend hard currency in order to have a satellite built for them, be that a communication satellite, um, um, an earth imaging satellite, you know, to um, track um, wildlife, to um, monitor coasts, to monitor borders, etc. Uh, and well, of course, if uh, a satellite is built in a foreign country, there's little to no technology transfer, right? So you're spending money, you do get a satellite, satellites have a shelf life, they become obsolete, and their orbit decays after a certain amount of years, and they become unusable. Uh, and you've spent this money, you got the use out of it, but you never actually ended up building up your own space technology. But Mika, there's a huge drive in the global north to exploit uh, near space for a profit. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, this is precisely, I think, why the ludicrous, this is a word, ludicrousness of uh, what the Nigerians experienced in 2005 as so-called unnecessary um, funding of space programs when, you know, space technology has the potential to create, you know, a more sustainable future in terms of if we're able to understand, as you said, weather patterns, mapping the earth, um, 
understanding science better in terms of physics and everything. We have the potential to make great discoveries in medicine and technology and environmental sustainability, etc. Yet we're told it's an unnecessary um, expenditure. Meanwhile, uh, we've seen how private space flight companies like, you know, ex-South African, um, oh, I mean, he's pretty South African still, I guess, in, in some sense, uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX, his company SpaceX, they basically get all these headlines about the innovation and how amazing it is that somebody took a private flight for personal gain and for private profiteering because, you know, it creates um, a different different revenue stream if he's able to fly people out um, for private space tours. And they're basically these massive capitalists who continue to to not only plunder our earth and you know elon musk he one of the components of tesla is lithium and when um when the just before the coup happened in bolivia and was it 2019 that ousted the first indigenous socialist leader evo morales he said you know we will coup whoever we want was one of his comments he made publicly because uh, bolivia has a great um, reserve of lithium right so these capitalists not only are plundering the earth and you use you know many of the core metals um, you find in kind of space technology and kind of aviation technology, transportation technology is coming from African mines, is coming from African natural resources and is exploited through um, cheap African labor and in the initial extraction process. But aside from that, what they're doing on our own earth, they're now hoping to plunder, you know, the stars and other planets for themselves. This isn't a kind of altruist venture. It's clear that they want to find other opportunities to expand um, their avenues for making profit. I wonder who's going to do the dirty work of extracting uh, uh, these minerals in an unsafe, uh, yes. literally hostile work environment. I wonder who they're going to recruit for that. Exactly. And, you know, in terms of actually doing this um, potential plundering of mineral resources in, uh, you know, asteroids and planets and stars. Um, one group estimated that mining the top 10 of 6,000 asteroids that NASA currently tracks could yield a profit of $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion. So they're looking for that in a context in wow. which they're, <laughs> the world leaders and all these rich people are unable to fund climate adaption um, projects, which I think the current one on the table from the UN is it estimates uh, around 100 billion is needed for climate adaption just for that. And um, the like top economies or countries with the leading economies have been unable to even fulfill that. So 100 billion would be a drop of water in 1.5 trillion. And just one asteroid, 16 Psyche, has been reported to contain 700 quintillion dollars worth of gold. I don't even know how many zeros quintillion has. I barely know billion, but quintillion must be a couple more zeros after the 12 of billion. Um, and basically... That is a lot of which, money. <laughs> those are big numbers. So if we had to put it in context, that's enough for every person on earth. So we are over 7 billion, every person on earth to receive about 93 billion. I mean, that's still, also, we could all be billionaires, literally. Be billionaires, <laughs> but I don't think that's the avenue we necessarily want to take, but we could. And, um, you know, researchers in occupied Palestine have simulated the impact and found that just one shipment of space minerals could devalue the price of gold on Earth by 50%. So, I mean, space exploration... Ah, so that's not happening. That is not happening. The Anglo-American will not allow it. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> There will be assassinations and coups before they, that happens. They've done it before. <laughs> They'll do it again and somebody will manage to grab at it. But basically, space exploration, as we're seeing it right now, in, in terms of the Western countries particularly, I would say, um, is anything but sustainable or equitable, which, you know, sustainability was supposed to be the theme of this year's um, National Space Week. 
And of course, Africa is essentially barred from participating in any of these processes. And I mean, China was barred from participating in the International Space Station because U.S. law prevented Americans from sharing information with, you know, their quote unquote rivals Um, or now in policy documents, they're calling it near peer rivals, um, China and Russia. And so we're not seeing a mood of cooperation that could help to democratize this process. Wasn't there something about uh, Kenya and China working together in space that got the uh, U.S. government riled up a few years ago? Yes. Yes, in 2020, towards the end of the year, the U.S. had raised alarms over there was going to be a, a planned partnership between Kenya and China. And they were arguing that it would put its own space expansion plans at risk. And they were overt about this. They were, it wasn't just necessarily, you know, the usual wagging your thumb that China's the enemy. Um, but we've seen in recent headlines that Kenya has joined a group of 17 countries who are going to participate in a cooperation project with China around space exploration. So it hasn't hindered them necessarily. And so back to Kenya, at the time, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, I think, Bridenstine, told the U.S. Congress that the deal would basically undercut Washington's relationships with Kenya. So you know, this then gave the Kenyan government certain concerns, and I think they pulled back at the time. But as we'll talk about shortly, um, they seem to have changed their tune. But of course, maybe it's a bit oversimplistic to say this, but we know that a part of why um, the global north continues to undercut, you know, relationships between global south actors like African countries and Chinese um projects is because ultimately when you look at the historical past in terms of the Soviet Union, you look at the contemporary in terms of China and their increasing um, capacity to take on um, different space explorations, it, these are the sons and daughters of peasants and you know factory workers who would have been condemned to illiteracy and a lack of education only a generation ago, but now are creating some of the biggest scientific breakthroughs of human history through a different ideological perspective and societal ordering, which um, you know we call socialism or um, socialism with Chinese characteristics in the case of China. Um, and so it's it. I think it, we can appreciate the fact that Space Week commemorates the Soviet Union's um, breakthrough in 1957. Uh, but right now, what we're finding is that the big economic game changes could be a new race to exploit the resources of near-Earth space. And this kind of space 2.0 is basically a race made up of private capital from the global north. And a lot of it is subsidized by the military-industrial complex of the US and the EU. Um, and so it for us is concerning. And the reason why we wanted to talk about it is because, you know, we don't necessarily get the chance to think about these questions on our day-to-day -day life because we're thinking about bread and butter issues and space see, feels so far away. But Africa needs to find a foothold in this and needs to be able to kind of, I think, leverage the fact that we have a lot of the core resources or raw materials that are the building blocks for a lot of this technology. So what's happening right now, we have three uh, taikonauts. These are um, Chinese astronauts, uh, uh, Chen Dong, Li uh, Yang, Kai Zhu, Zhu Zhe. I am butchering uh, <laughs> names again. But they, they're doing something really cool. They've been, they are going to stay in Earth orbit for six months. Uh, and a month ago, they participated in a live call, which was uh, Talk with a Taikonaut. Uh, and this was held uh, at the African Union in Addis Ababa, the capital of uh, Ethiopia. So uh, they were actually uh, taking live questions from people from Africa um, through the African Union headquarters. Maybe we can listen to this clip because in recent news, um, the Chinese government reported recently that they're going to embark on a cooperation, a space cooperation with 17 countries, one of them including Kenya. So let's have a listen to this clip. Three Chinese astronauts communicated on Tuesday from space via video link with students from at least eight African countries and shared their experience during Shenzhou 14 space flight. The Takanauts, Liu Yang, Chen Dong and Tai Xu Zhe fielded questions from the young Africans during the dialogue. For these Egyptian University students, 
This was a rather unique and exciting opportunity. They were here at Cairo's Egyptian Chinese University to get a glimpse of life in outer space with their eyes fixated on the screen. They got a chance to learn more about life in space from the Shinzo 14 crew. Most of the Egyptian students here were young women. They wanted to know more from Taikonaut Liu Yang on how a woman could become an astronaut. She's given me like an insp inspiration. She, she's like a hardworking person. Uh, she followed her dream and she became an astronaut and uh, I like, really, really like her personality. <laughs> The event exceeded my expectations. It was impressive. I am proud to be studying the language of a country as developed as China. I was amazed to see how people are living in space and how happy they are with their job. Professionals from the Egyptian Space Agency, university professors and students alike were all ears as the Shinzo 14 Taikonauts answered their queries. Of course, it's not just a matter of uh, seeing a, mo a movie for uh, two hours or more. Uh, it's, it gives them great ambitions to, for their future, uh, how to change even their point of view, their way of life. I, I talked to some students when we were coming out of the lecture of the room. They feel that they are different. And this is what we uh, target. China continues to support Africa in developing its expertise in space science. African countries have in recent years been paying increasing attention to developing their space technologies and space sector. China is interested in supporting African interests and to provide assistance in accomplishing these needs. Egypt and China are working on several projects that aim to enhance Cairo's space science capacity. The two countries are working together in building a satellite as well as a space monitoring and remote sensing stations. Okay, that was interesting. So, uh, the Tiangong Space Station, popularly known as uh, Heavenly Palace, is uh, a station that uh, China is uh, building in, around in Earth orbit. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, it has its own power, propulsion, life support system and living quarters. Um, China seeks to complete the space station and send the first person um, to the moon uh, by uh, 2030. So the space station is actually part of a larger project um, of um, Chinese-led uh, kind of uh, space exploration. And uh, there's actually a really cool plan that, you know, eventually when they do the moon in 2030 and the station is well set up, that a team may even be sent to Jupiter and Mars to collect samples, which would be like, wow. <laughs> I'm a total space nerd, by the way. You know, I grew up watching Star Trek, so when Star Trek was still good. So um, I, I love this sort of stuff. This, this is just uh, candy to me. And I think it's this sort of um, engagement and this kind of sharing of this common fascination for space that I find so interesting about the Chinese space program. As we mentioned with my um, fellow countrymen, um, Edward Mukuka and Coloso, um, space allows us to dream. Space, the idea of space exploration, inspires us, you know. And uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Nkoloso was a very fascinating character. Um, however you want to look at him, there is a really good article I read in preparation for this podcast, which we'll link to in the show notes, that uh, tells you a little bit about his story and examines if he was serious, if he was a little bit of uh, a crazy person, a crazy dreamer, or if he was a troll, literally trolling <laughs> the, the international media and just having a laugh and a little bit of fun. But fascinating character, fascinating story. And I think it also speaks to the spirit of the time when people in Africa thought anything was possible. And uh, maybe looking at what China is doing in space, we can capture some of that enthusiasm, some of that inspiration, some of that motivation, again, for our own um, kind of uh, venture into space, right? So, um, for example, the uh, African Union uh, Commissioner for Education, Mohamed uh, Belosin, 
um, said during the uh, talk with the Taikonauts that there's room for cooperation, there's room for sharing experiences, there's room for accompanying the African continent to go its own steps in as far as space science is concerned. So clearly, at least people in the African Union who work there are thinking that, hey, there is an opportunity for cooperation, for joint ventures, for common cause here. So several countries, including Ethiopia, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, and Namibia, have already started their own space journey with Chinese help, which uh, includes uh, satellite launches and um, the building of uh, aerospace infrastructure. Um, China is also doing something really interesting. So China has its own GPS uh, system called uh, Baidu, and uh, it wants to enhance and increase Baidu's uh, global service capacity by establishing a cooperation um, with uh, countries throughout the Middle East and Africa. And actually, the first overseas Baidu uh, ground station um, is in Tunisia, in uh, North Africa. And uh, they are already conducting satellite navigation cooperation and testing with countries such as Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, of course, South Africa, Algeria, amongst others. Now, um, another interesting uh, little tidbit about uh, China-Africa space cooperation is that um, a special uh, satellite assembly integration and test center has been built in Egypt with Chinese help to kind of help Egypt lay a solid foundation for their own aerospace industry. And uh, again, in North Africa, China has also assisted Algeria in launching its first ever communication satellites. Um, and it's also actually helped uh, to complete the in-orbit delivery of Sudan's first scientific um, experimental kind of satellite. So clearly, uh, North Africa, Northeast Africa, really seizing the moment to leverage China, <laughs> so to say, or to leverage cooperation with China to um, kind of develop their own nascent space capabilities. And I think this, this, you know, this goes back to a running theme here, Mika. We're always talking about that we are pro-Africans, we want to put Africa's interest at heart, and especially African agency, and that it's all about agency. You know, China is open for business. You know, you can come to China as an African government and say, what can we do that you guys can help us lay the foundation of our own space capabilities, right? So there is a lot of agency at play here, and we are not really seeing this sort of cooperation with the global north. I think most of them are not interested in this sort of thing. So very exciting things happening. Uh, going back to uh, Baidu, the, um, the Chinese uh, global positioning system, um, they are also in talks with the African Union uh, to kind of see how they can work with, um, with African states to improve satellite-guided navigation on the continent. I think that's amazing. I think space is the future. It's a new frontier, one of the many exciting frontiers of scientific and technological development. And I personally feel very strongly about the fact that Africa should not be left behind. We had dreamers like uh, Edward Mkuka Nkoloso. We need these dreamers again. But we don't just need to dream it. We need to do it. And particularly right now, because, I mean, ultimately, my biggest concern, as um, I think I raised, is that scientific and technological gains of space exploration should belong to all of humanity. But in fact, a tiny select few, predominantly in the global north, uh, who are exploring it are doing so for exploitation and, and are basically uh, benefiting from the continued exploitation of Africa's um, human and mineral resources in order to do so, in, in order to achieve it. Uh, I mean, I would love us to have a session on satellite technology because I was watching on Netflix um, one of these explained and it was about the first satellite technology being launched by the US military and then how they commercialized that. Um, but still, there was a monopoly 
on who gets to own and control that kind of technology. And so we don't want to see that going in the future. We don't want uh, a, a, a Africa to be left behind, one, but then we also want Africa to participate in, I think, this more profit-oriented forms of space exploration. We want ones that will benefit humankind and benefit and increase our potential to advance um, not only as a continent, but as human beings in an earth that's becoming increasingly um, more challenging to live on. We want to solve the issues that we ourselves have created. And um, the fact of the different scientific uh, developments that are happening in space could help us do that. Most definitely. And here's a, a little factual tidbit. The first person of African descent in space was Cuban Air Force pilot, Arnaldo Tamayo Mendes, he was also the first Latin American and the first Cuban person in space, um, went into space with the Soviet Union, and he actually won an Order of Lenin for that. So very based African in space. I know we're stretching the concept of African right now, but it's super important to show our solidarity. The diaspora is African I don't accept that the diaspora is part of us. But more than that, more than that, because Cuba is undergoing an extremely difficult time, uh, you know, more than 60 years of sanctions. They were recently hit by Hurricane Ian and their contributions to humanity time and time again do not get recognized. And they're forced to live under uh, a warlike economic war embargo um, when in fact they are contributing to some of the important uh, scientific discoveries. And on that note, thank you very much for listening to this week's episode of The Crane, an Africa-China podcast. Follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Dongsheng News. We're also on the web and on Telegram. Thank you for listening in. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps us grow and it helps other people like you find this podcast. Thank you for listening in. We look forward to next time.